Hello everyone. Today is January 19th, 2022. Welcome to Natural Pigment Studio and today we will talk about silver points. Uh, that is probably one of the most exciting uh, programs we will have and this is uh, this will be unusual format for us and if we we like that very much and if you will like how it's uh, will look to uh, go today so then uh, we probably will repeat and uh, we will do that not only with uh, silver points which because we found even more artists after when we announce uh, with whom we will talk and uh, so but we probably will do this even with oil colors and so where we will invite artists for interview and uh, this is our first time uh, it will be a couple of uh, probably hiccups and so stay with us um, why the hiccups because uh, we thought then we will interview for great artists and so then we thought we will kind of uh, cut little bit after that and uh, um, show you this uh, interviews so when we work every night with George and we were cutting and cutting and cutting and it was difficult and I apologize to our uh, interviewed artists because uh, interview uh, even shorter and we we struggle to cut every word of yours so what we did whole interview you can see actually on YouTube uh, today will be uh, 11 o'clock uh, George will put uh, Pacific time it will be available for everybody and you can see whole links uh, but for now what we will do again program will be a little bit different we will talk about products first then you will understand what will be available for you because every artist whom we interview was so excited to talk about this medium and uh, so then at least you know what we have in store for you and uh, so you like always you can ask uh, questions during the uh, interview but on the link below we will have the all <clears throat> links for the interviews and the for products but guess what gift for you um, after uh, first three interview we will have interview with Ku Shadler so she will answer all your questions so after interview stay tuned with us and so you can actually ask questions live and uh, so Ku uh, was uh, so um, kind enough from uh, from Mexico. So we are on online right now with you. So she will answer all uh, your questions. So for now, let's talk about what we have for you um, in our uh, in our store. So uh, we are talking about silver points, and silver points one of the uh, oldest uh, medium. And when you think about silver points, you think like, this is easy. So how many metals you have, how many uh, shades you have. So because every each of them will look, George will right now show the second. Okay, here. So we have for you silver, uh, pure silver, uh, sterling silver, copper, red brass, yellow brass, a bronze. We This is new one for us. We, we didn't have bronze before. So we have aluminum, silver, nickel, lead. And you can see then actually all of them uh, look gray. But you can see when they, when artists will talk about tarnishing and you will see that they, they tarnish all different. So like so what will be silver here. And uh, yes, thank you very much, George. So I like this. And so copper look like almost greenish. And so, and here I, I will show you. So this is actually um, gradation done with uh, our pads. Okay, like this. So we have aluminum pad, we have bronze pad and copper pad. And you can see, so th this would be for copper, how that copper uh, uh, tarnish, bronze tarnish a little bit warmer and uh, and so aluminum is very dark so this this would be 
the choice and so that that how it's look like on the paper too so in the again um now we have paper for the uh, silver points which before uh, we didn't have now we have a paper uh it's uh, mostly for uh, for sketches probably and so just to figure out how to uh, to work the silver point so the silver point work is so for uh, in in our store what we have the it's styluses it's called stylus so then on one side it's a thin stylus you can put here okay let me see and uh, just for you to to see not many people understand and you can actually not only squeeze but you need to um what is it turn it turn it yes thank you george like always behind the camera and helping me with english so and uh, on another side uh, of that uh, stylus you can put a wide stylus uh, stylus yes and so then that's how you can actually use for both sides so this one so uh, regular our kits they uh, so we have just um, a starter kit where you can this is great box and so just two uh, two different styluses and um, and uh, no not no not stylus so silver points and uh, and the one stylus this is uh, on the sale right now and uh, so we have that one beginning uh, set so uh, again here's three styluses and uh, we do have we do have uh, uh, sandpaper so if if you think then uh, the edge of the uh, silver is not um, sharp enough for you so then you can sharpen this and uh, here's we include the paper and uh, of course gift set which is nice one so i like that one the most so we have the ground so a little bit just to start with ground so we have the paper and uh, so instruction and on the uh, on the box uh, you have uh, six different um, um, silver points and three different uh, wool, uh, wool pads and uh, copper pad and uh, bronze pad um, uh, every artist uh, uh, today what we interview would talk will talk about the uh, grounds and so we we have several choices for you so the most common of course it's traditional silver silver point ground and uh, but you can uh, choose the easy gesso which is absolutely our bestseller but you can add any um minerals to that and so uh Ku will talk about uh, different minerals uh, today so then uh, you can uh, absolutely use that one and we have couple uh, couple sets left from uh, christmas so it's a naughty box it's still like in in beautiful boxes yes so not many of them but great price again so then and uh, naughty box oh it's even still beautiful um and so uh, there's uh, uh four different um, uh different uh silver points where the bounty has every uh every silver point what we have but thin ones and so and of course the the style is there too so then um that would be uh sale for today and uh for uh, probably like what we probably will end of uh, uh the months it's not much left and um so uh again reminder on uh you ask any questions and uh george and ku will uh answer immediately on the uh on the chat but stay with us until and that will be a little bit longer again uh, we didn't expect that long but we just could not cut more information and it's so valuable for you and we hope that some of you from today will start uh, draw with silver points okay let's go Thank you, Lauren, for uh, joining us on this Artist Materials Advisor, uh, this episode on Silver Point. What did attract you to using Silver Point? And it seems like that is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you're doing quite a number of Silver Point drawings now in your art. Yes, 
it's it's very safe to say that it is the primary medium that I utilize. Um, I graduated from college right in the middle of the recession. I thought, I don't want to look for a job right now. This looks very scary. So I decided to go to graduate school. Um, again, I was very fortunate to get accepted into a great graduate program. I went to the New York Academy of Art and a fellow student came back to my apartment one night, saw how neatly everything was laid out in the apartment, had been exposed to Silver Point via a previous professor of his named John Beavers. And he said, I think this medium fits your temperament, just, you know, gauging what your domestic environment looks like. I thought he was a bit of a jerk, but then I ended up marrying him. So <laughs> he read me like a book from the get-go. So it was, it was through another student who's now my husband, um, there at the academy and um, exposure he'd gotten. And I, I find that to be kind of a recurring theme that, uh, you know, especially pre, this was pre-Instagram and social media really proliferating, that Silver Point was one of those things that was kind of like verbally, quietly handed from one to another, again, really evoking some of its more anachronistic qualities. Mm -hmm. So what, um, what, qualities, uh, besides, of course, the meticulousness in Silver Point, mm -hmm. what are the qualities uh, about Silver Point that you really like in terms of both visual and just possibly the mm -hmm. human qualities? I think it's, it's, such a, it's such an odd paradox of a medium in that it requires such fastidiousness and such precision to create something that ends up being so ephemeral. You know, you have to exert all this control in your draftsmanship when you're creating your drawing. And then when you're done with it, you know, you have to kind of let it go and know that it's going to tarnish or kind of keep slowly evolving and altering in its its state long after, you know, you're, you're done touching it. Um, so I appreciate that there's this duality to it that, you know, you have control, but then you let go of control you're creating something that looks so fleeting and delicate, but yet it's so demanding of your attention, um, especially in such a, you know, in such a digital world. If anything, I've come just to appreciate it as a tool to keep, to ensure that my focus remains intact with all the digital distractions I have. Um, and the approach to drawing to Silver Point is really interesting to me because it really, you know, there's a lot of great drawing instruction traditions that are similar to the Bard method or that revolve around cast drawings. And they're these beautiful, enveloped, linear foundations that then get immaculately rendered. And that's so important. But with silver point, you can't really smudge or blur as easily. The marks are, are a little more permanent. So, um, and it's inevitable with a limited value range that things are going to kind of flatten out anyway. So mm -hmm. I think Silver Point has made cross contour hatch marks so incredibly important to me. And, and I love how, because I know that the drawing may risk looking a little more flat, I try to start everything almost more like a small architectural diagram. Like all my forms are reduced to little cylinders and boxes and, and ovoid shapes and, and things like that. So that it's almost more like I'm trying to draw geometric forms and then soften them. And then that's the rendering of the drawing. And I think any drawing media or method that gets you to think about things more sculpturally, you know, with the, with the context of your subject as something, if it's representational or figurative, because there's absolutely gorgeous abstract silver point drawings that are being made, but at least if it's more representational as as something that's not just comprised of really perfect lines, but almost like how do you create the optical illusion of, of what you're drawing as something that recedes backwards in space and comes forward into space. So the fact that, again, something that's kind of so delicate looking, actually, I think, is really well tackled when you're drawing, if you're thinking sculpturally, geometrically, architectonically. I really like that too. I really, really enjoy that. And I've, I've enjoyed that. Um, I've noticed that more, the more I keep working in the medium, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's very good. And that kind of leads me to the next question, which is, and I think mm -hmm. you've already kind of, you've 
uh, in, 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 in Fergit is, which is one of the challenges that you find in Silverpoint, because frankly, yeah. it's, it's, you know, not an easy medium for many people, uh, at least certainly yeah. when you start off. Oh yeah. Oh, I can definitely attest to that. I think when I, when I first started making silver points, they were, you know, like postcard size mm -hmm. and they've, they've only expanded with time and, and familiarity with the medium. And I think, I think, um, Again, I, I think you you really articulated the challenges of the medium. It kind of was it. I think it was Socrates who, who said something like, "The one thing I know is that I know nothing," mm -hmm. and and any exacting drawing media reminds you of that over and over again. So it's you know it's going into it, it's starting a drawing knowing that the drawing may not look anything like what you expect or want it to be, and it's going into the drawing knowing that you really have to kind of. Um, lend yourself over to the medium itself that it kind of takes precedence and it's almost like you're the conductor of an orchestra you know maybe you're not even so much the musician playing the instrument but you're just guiding the song along even from a distance so um you you see a lot of people adopt silver point and get a very uh startling dose of reality in terms of where their draftsmanship skills really, really are. So mm -hmm. again, it's, it's almost, you know, going into it, knowing that you might fall flat on your face and uh, being willing to kind of get yourself up and dust yourself off and start a new piece rather than let it get to you mentally. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the, of course, one of the challenges too is, and, and especially in, in realistic uh, drawing is uh, mm -hmm. how do you deal with the the tonal range because like you mentioned it, it does have yeah. a lot of tonal range yeah uh, and I know so like, um, a lot of your drawings uh, seem to achieve uh, some very dark tones which is much more difficult to do in silver point yeah a lot of it has to do with the grounder support mm -hmm. um, I think and and you know being willing to experiment with that. Um, being willing to wear a bit of a mad scientist cap, I guess, before you even start the actual drawing of the drawing. Um, you know, uh, for me over the years, I've had a lot of opportunity to kind of, I don't know how it's to, like mix and match different, different ingredients, bone ash, marble dust into a traditional gesso into just maybe some acrylic paint into case, you know, just kind of um, pick and choose and experiment. And I think you can do things to create a ground or a gesso which yields a more ample value range than you would expect but you know I, I find more than anything just being willing to go over that line over and over and over and over again mm -hmm. is is kind of the key component and i i notice also that you're beside silver uh i noticed that you've mm -hmm. also used a little bit of gold points uh how yes how do you use that in your work? What do you what do you see with the gold point okay. that, or achieve that you necessarily can't get with uh, with the silver? That's a great question. I use the gold point for laying in my drawings, okay. um, so it tends to be a little warmer and a little bit lighter. Mm -hmm. And um, I I try not to use it too much because I am conscientious of how the gold and the silver like one will tarnish and one will not. So mm -hmm. I don't want like an odd little patch of like. Uh, untarnished metal you know it's inevitable the silver will get darker and warmer than the gold oddly enough um but the gold is i think much harder so it's fainter and lighter so again for for laying in um an image it's it's really really phenomenal and and since it it is harder at least anecdotally for me observationally it seems to keep a really really fine tip a lot longer so again the tip doesn't abrade quite so quickly so if you do have to go in for like eyelashes or really really like i've done like stones on pieces of jewelry in gold because you really can get in and like almost needle every single tiny hair and, and facet of a tiny gemstone into its own rendering hmm. beautifully you know how well, what would you say about that that aspect about looking at a reproduction as opposed to seeing it oh. you know in, in person well, uh, photographing silver point drawings is a pill. Oh my God. It's probably, I'm going to be totally honest. I absolutely hate it. And one thing I do while I do enjoy working larger and, you know, and to clarify, I've never gilded on paper. I've only gilded on panel, which mm -hmm. for me only goes to a certain size. I've always kept it on a 
on a solid, solid substrate. Um, while I enjoy working larger in silver point on paper, um, I do miss making silver points at a scale that I could just like scan in mm -hmm. a cheapo desk jet or something. Um, because photo photographing them is, you're, you're always so torn between, okay, do I keep the light low enough to show that I have been able to achieve, you know, a more ample value range than anticipated? Or do I want the beautiful, um, like warm white background of this gesso that I've labored over? It's, you're being pulled between all these different priorities and it's so incredibly difficult to, to choose which one to prioritize. Um, so I, I've played with the idea. I haven't yet looked into it of having my drawings professionally scanned using a large format scanner. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, I think that is one, no pun intended, one silver lining of, of social media is that you can do things like create little videos of mm -hmm. light falling across the piece that do a really, really great job of illustrating um, you know, how the, how the piece kind of like shimmers and evolves just during the day. So, you know, any chance I can to have studio visits rather than um, just send me a photo, I really jump at because it really makes, you know, and that's the comment you hear from every, that I'm sure all the other artists you're interviewing will say, when people see a silver in person, they react to it with, uh, you know, such such surprise and, and even a bit of like an infantile delight, you know, versus just seeing a photo of it. it they really don't photograph. Well, thank you, uh, Mike, for uh, joining us on this episode of Art Artist Materials Advisor. We're talking about silver point and this uh, ancient medium and how it's used today in contemporary art. And so I want to yeah. welcome you, uh, Mike, to this, uh, this session. Um, Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And um, can you tell us a little bit, uh, uh, give us a little bit of background, um, you know, how you started in art and, uh, um, and what's, what's the main focus of your art today? Sure. Um, after college, I had a career in the Air Force. And so I came to art making kind of later in my life. Um, when I started making art, I was I gravitated to painting, and a friend of mine uh, told me that I should look into encaustic paint. I didn't know very much about it, and he didn't know very much about it, but my search led me eventually to the Thea Mummy portraits at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. And I was hooked after that. I was just fascinated by them and I wanted to learn everything I could. And so I started on uh, about a two decade long journey, uh, learning about encaustic paint and making um, realistic landscapes with encaustic paint. Um, and along the way, I, I wanted to do it the way the Romans did it with natural earth pigments. And so that led me to natural pigments and that's where i got my pigments to paint with and while i was on your site one one day i came across some an article i think it was an article about silver point drawing mm -hmm. and i it was something that i had heard about but really didn't know anything about again and so it sent me off on another tangent and i started doing research about silver point drawing and um that led me to doing a lot of um, experimentation with different kind of grounds and, and things. And so that's what got me into the drawing part of it. So I, I noticed you do a lot of different work in, in uh, you've worked in different medium oils and, and uh, I know some work in egg tempera. Uh, is, and, and um, is most of your work in, in which you mentioned encaustic is, is, would you say most of your work is, is encaustic medium? It, well, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, for the past 20 years or so, I've been pretty much an encaustic painter. Mm. Um, spread in between there, there's been some oil painting and egg temper painting. Um, I've drawn all along with different things, but just kind of recently I started really getting excited about metal point drawings. Mm -hmm. Mostly silver and gold, but I've done a few other things. 
Um, and so I have a show coming up in March that will be just silver point drawings. Oh, okay. Actually, metal point drawings. There's a few gold drawings in there. Sure. Um, and so for the last couple, three years, that's been my focus is metal point drawing. Oh, okay. I yeah, see. But, but, so what, yeah. um, what are... What are some of the things that you like about silver point as opposed to, for instance, other types of drawing medium like charcoal and graphite? Yeah. Uh, the very first thing that really caught my eye about um, metal point drawing was looking at Michelangelo's drawings. Mm -hmm. I saw a show um, that had several of his drawings in it. And um, while they're nothing like my drawings, uh, they're, they fascinated me with how delicate the line was. Um, and how I like how it tarnishes. I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, the silver and um, they just they have such a different look, a different feel than graphite or charcoal. Um, they feel kind of in a way special to me. And uh, so that that line of Michelangelo's is what really got me going about it. And, um, while I don't use draw with a lot of line, I draw with a lot of um, shading and tonality, but um, that, that's what first got me excited about it. Yeah. Oh, great. What are some of the challenges you find uh, with uh, Silver Point? Um, well, um, it's very slow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I like to get heavy, heavy shading with it. And so that takes a lot of time, mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of patience. So I will, when I'm drawing, um, I will take breaks in between and do smaller drawings or small doodles, uh, sketches in between, getting ready for paintings and things like that. Uh, and then just keep going back to it. When, I, when I'm working on a larger silver point drawing, I'll leave it out in my studio and so that I can look at it all the time and then uh, just pick the tools up and, and draw with it at any time. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a plein air kind of person. I like my studio, <laughs> mm -hmm. so it works well for me. I, I, I'm in my studio a lot and I can uh, then just to see it but that the time that it takes to draw with metal point uh is certainly a challenge mm -hmm. for me it made me have to slow down um which was probably a good thing mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh so yeah that that's definitely the biggest challenge for me i really like the process of preparing the ground, preparing the, the surfaces to work on. I like drawing on paper rather than hard surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, I've done both, um, but I like the paper much better. I like finding different kinds of papers. Uh, right now, uh, I really like twin rocker paper. Uh, how do you protect the, the final drawing? Um, framing, glass, what are some of the things that you do for that? Yeah, well, I always mat them with conservation mats mm -hmm. and then put them under glass and frame them. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Great. I never, I haven't, uh, I've experimented with a few um, sprays to mm -hmm. seal the drawings, but I've never gotten the uh, courage to spray a final drawing yet with yeah. one of them. <laughs> Uh, it seems like every time I use a use a, a spray of some sort, it, it changes yeah. the surface a little bit. And so I just don't want to do that. Right, right. <clears throat> you mentioned, of course, you've, you've worked in, besides Silver Point, what other metals uh, have you worked in? And can you talk a little bit about what are some of the things that you like about these different metals? Sure, sure. <clears throat> um, I've used gold quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I really like gold. Gold is smoother than silver, and um, I can you can get darker darks with gold than with silver. Um, Which most I like people the think way... is, is counterintuitive because they're thinking of the the color gold as opposed to the light right. it makes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You don't see the gold at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is really kind of funny, and, and it's kind of curious why you don't. Yeah. 
um, the gold, of course, doesn't tarnish. Mm -hmm. And so as the, as the one thing that I like about the silver is that the silver does tarnish mm -hmm. and it just gives it a very nice patina and makes the drawing look cool. Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> it makes it look neat over time. Yeah. So silver and gold, those are my two main ones. I've used copper. Copper is fun, but it's harder and it's a little more difficult to control. And then it gets a kind of that greenish tint to it as it ages. And I don't really care for that too much. Um, I've used steel, steel wool, mm -hmm. um, and steel itself, soft steel. Um, those are nice, but again, much harder than silver or gold. And so um, it's a little more difficult to use. And I've done one drawing with lead. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, it, it turned out nice. But it kind of scared me working with it. I just didn't. I just don't think I need to worry about the poisoning part of lead. So yeah, sure. yeah so I put that away. Sure. <laughs> what would you? Um, so we have, of course, a, there's going to be a lot of artists who have never done silver point before who may be watching this. And what would you? Uh, what advice would you give them, or would you tell them uh, starting off in silver point? Um, you know, if you're, if you're drawing with graphite or charcoal, both of those mediums have their drawbacks in that they can be messy. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of technical things, especially with graphite and that you need to understand the, the hardness of the lead that you're using, um, what kind of paper you're drawing on. There's a lot of things with graphite that I find much more challenging than I do with silver point. Mm -hmm. With silver point, um, getting the ground correct is the hardest part, mm -hmm. but it's really not that hard. I mean, it's it's really a very a pretty simple thing to do, and you can put a ground on just about any surface. Um, and then you have one 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 tool, and that's your your silver tip or your gold tip, and so it's really very easy to get started with is kind of the simplest form of drawing really except for the ground. Um, you can't draw directly onto paper. It won't make any mark at all on a, on a plain sheet of paper. But putting that ground down is just uh, similar to putting a ground on a canvas for painting too. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not that big a deal really. Great. Okay. Michael, I want to thank you for joining us on, on this, uh, this episode of the Artist Materials Advisor. And, um, and of course, we will, we look forward to having you back again, in which case we'll be talking about encaustics. Thank you very much, George. I appreciate it. Great. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Aaron, for uh, joining us on this episode of the Artist Materials Advisor. And um, we're going to be talking about, of course, Silver Point. But before we do that, um, I'd like to know a little bit more about how you started in art. What, uh, what's, you know, what were the motivations or the, uh, that helped you go, go into art? Well, I, my background was an undergrad in art history. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think I realized as I was doing the degree that my interest in the materials was I actually wanted to be making the paintings more than just studying it. Um, but going to school in the early 90s, I didn't have a lot of, um, there wasn't a lot of traditional mediums being taught where I was going to school. So I finished that up and then I ended up going into illustration, just kind of self-taught, writing and mm -hmm. in, in illustrating children's books. I was always more interested in figurative art. And I think my dream was always to go back and learn egg tempera. And then at some point I just decided that's um, that was what I was gonna do. So mm -hmm. I took it first as just, this is gonna be this side fun thing that I do on the, you know, on my free time and, um, but then realized that that's actually what I wanted to do full time. So mm -hmm. uh, for the last few years, that's what I've been doing. Do you build um, up? Uh, do you build up all the tonal values that you anticipate in the, in the painting through the silver point? 
I do. Yeah, it's I, I fully render it. And then um, and then I go and I do, um, you know, just tones with a tempera, usually, you know, like a sienna or umber and do the green and then start building up colors after that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, great. So what what qualities of silver point did you like as a as a drawing medium? What what attracted you to that? Um, for me, it's well, it's very ethereal. Like I love, you know, what I love about the silver is when it's left and it just sort of, you know, tarnishes and it's almost like a tone on tone. Mm -hmm. um, and when I'm drawing with it, even on the egg tempera panels, when I know it's going to be covered, that sort of shimmer that you get, you know, when you put it in the light and it, um, I don't know, it just, it's like a little bit of magic. <laughs> <laughs> and I also like that. I mean, I think part of why you use it is that it, you know, it doesn't come off into the pigments um, when I'm adding the pigments on, which, uh, you know, initially that seemed to make a lot of sense. I don't have to worry about any kind of oil in the pencil or any, you know, any of that coming off into the pigments. Um, so that was sort of my initial. And I think I, I think a lot of people are intimidated because you can't erase it or you think you can't erase it but um i don't know that's not been a huge problem i tend to work out i work out composition prior to doing a render drawing in silver point anyway so um if there's few things that need to change i you can kind of fiddle with it and make it work so mm -hmm. yeah so do you um what are the challenges you found in uh, you mentioned of course, what most people find is challenging is the fact that there's a very, you know, no erasure. But uh, what it, it, was that the only challenge that you found? Uh, and you, you said that that wasn't as big of a challenge for you. Uh, what challenge did you find in, in learning well, and I developing? For me, uh, for me, the biggest challenge has been finding a ground to use when it's not on an egg temper panel. Um, mm -hmm. I, the last year, been trying to do, I did like a series of drawings for a show, and I I also used some objects and other things, and I wanted to, so I needed a ground to put on paper. Um, I, I haven't found the perfect ground. I love the traditional ground because of the texture and because it's close to, you know, an original old-fashioned jazzo, but, um, what the way I've been doing the drawings is kind of like how I work in egg tempera, which is I do a fully rendered drawing and then I'll actually scumble it out and I'll draw an, again on top of it. And so you get a little bit of the layering and it's a much softer look than just say one layer of, of a drawing. And what I found is if I use the traditional ground on the lower layers, I can sometimes too often completely erase the drawing um, when I when I put a scumble on it. Mm -hmm. And so I've tried acrylic rounds and using that on the under layers and then just using a traditional ground on the top because I don't really like to paint with acrylic. I don't like using plastic, mm -hmm. but it does seem to keep the drawing a little better when I'm trying to do that layering. Mm -hmm. And I don't think most I, I don't know if, most, honestly, I don't even know how most people do their uh, silver point. Um, maybe the layering is just me being stupid <laughs> or quirky. Um, but uh, yeah, so getting that to work has been a challenge. And I, I feel like I'm getting it. I feel like I'm slowly experimenting my way into getting that technique to, to not be a disaster every other time. <laughs> so. Right, right. What kind of supports do you do you like to work on for Silver Point? Well, for Silver Point, I've been the the one I love the most is just a, a traditional Jezo board. Um, mm -hmm. I've been using icon panels for paintings, and that's what I like to draw on the best. the The texture is just unbeatable, but. Um, I've been experimenting, like I said, with hot and cold. I think um, a smooth paper is a little bit lusher and nicer. It's been taking um, the ground a, better, a little bit better. Um, 
but I've been experimenting on all kinds of, you know, I did a resin cast of a lion skull and did it on there and just trying to see what else um, it might work on that is um, maybe less traditional. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, you, you did, uh, I saw one piece you've done. It's, um, it was, I, if I believe it was, it was an egg. Oh and, yeah, it was yeah. an ostrich egg. <laughs> what, what was the so? What was that? Uh, was that a ceramic egg or was that a wood or? It, yeah, other? it was actually it was an ostrich egg. Oh and really? So <laughs> yeah, and I had um, I played around with chicken eggs, and you could put the silver point directly on this on the on a chicken egg, and it mm -hmm. take the silver. So I was like, oh, I'll try this, but not an ostrich egg. It didn't work. So I ended up covering that with layers of ground. And mm -hmm. again, I, I initially used an acrylic ground and then covered it with the more traditional, um, for a few more layers before right. I worked on it. Yeah. Oh, great. So what, um, uh, what other metal points or, or metals have you, have you, have you done any experimentation Besides, of course, the silver, uh, have you worked with any other metals in um, in, in your in your uh, drawings? I've worked with gold. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I've seen it done where you can really see the difference. I know Ku has a class, and I some would day would like to take it because she has, I think, perfected like everything her technique. Um, but I, I did not find the way that I'm using it there to be a huge difference. And I missed having the tarnishing that happens with the mm -hmm. silver. Um, I, I like that look and I like once it gets that sort of golden hue that the gold really never got that. So mm -hmm. I went back to silver. If you were to advise a beginning art, or an artist that wanted to start in silver point, um, what would you, what would you advise them? How would you, uh, what's the best tips that you would have to help them get started and really get up to speed as soon as possible? Because it does take time. Um, I would say just to dive in and not be precious about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, that's, that's anything is just assume that it's not all going to work and just take it as a lesson of how you like to work and not worry too much about, um, being perfect or following the perfect from the beginning. I mm -hmm. think, um, I would say that it's much easier to just, you know, get yourself a little stylus and, and get, get a decent one in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, I think when I first was experimenting, I picked up some cheap stylus on like Amazon or something and it's too fat it doesn't really work and they're really not that expensive so just get a good stylus and get a couple you know pieces of decent silver and um if you're intimidated by the grounds you know golden has one that's really easy to slap on and, and experiment with the traditional ground i was very intimidated by because you have to it's kind of like a baking lesson in in how to get the gel to form and all that so mm -hmm. if that's stopping you from doing it then just get a cheap ground to play with and sure. and then um and don't wait too long because the real ground is is nice to work with yeah. <laughs> but yeah and i mean i i was just putting it on um scraps of paper and you know try try find what works for you because i know when i was reading People like different things, hot press, cold press, whatever. And um, yeah, don't be precious. That's a good, that's, that's good advice. Yeah. Because that's true for anything that we need to start on. Just, just put your, you know, put your both feet in and just get going. Thank you, Aaron, for, for joining us on this episode and, um, uh, and, and for sharing your artwork with us and telling us a little bit about what you're doing in, in regards to Silver Point. Really appreciate that. Anytime. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Ku, to this uh, uh, episode of the Art Materials Advisor. We're going to be talking exclusively about Silver Point. And thank you for, for joining us.
Uh, oh, thank today. you for having me. Yeah, it's, it's our pleasure. And you and I have known each other for quite a long time, actually. I think it was the late 90s. I met mm -hmm. you at a Temper Society meeting. And, right. um, and of course, at that time, I was starting my interest in Tempra. And mm -hmm. um, so can you explain, uh, how did you get interested in, and I know some of how you got interested, how you started in, uh, in Tempra. Maybe you can explain a little bit about that. And, and then how you started in, in Silverpoint. Well, I was an art history major in college. I didn't study studio art, but I always wanted to be a painter. So I, I tried it off and on throughout my 20s into my early 30s, lived in Florence. I was an art furniture maker for a while, did a lot of different creative things. But eventually, in the early 90s, I took a history of painting class taught by Chester Arnold. He's a wonderful painter. And we did a different medium every week. We did encaustic and fresco. And the week we did a tempera, something resonated with me, and Chester recognized that. And he said, you're going to be an egg tempera painter. I didn't know what he meant, but he was right. <laughs> but I still, I spent the next several years in the early 90s studying classical oil painting with a husband-wife couple, Numael and Shirley Politos, wonderful painters. And I went back and forth between oil and egg tempera, but I finally chose egg tempera as my primary medium um, and it was Shirley Polito, who several years later in the early 2000s, knowing that I loved a tempera, said to me, I think you would like silver point. And I said, what silver point? I'd never <laughs> even heard of it. So I went out and I bought a piece of uh, silver jewelry wire and I stuck it in a dowel and I just started drawing my true gesso panels that I use for a tempera. Mm -hmm. And that was it. I fell in love with it the way I fell in love with a tempera. Well, thank you. So what, um, what aspects of Silver Point do you like? What, what are the qualities of Silver Point <laughs> that make it useful as a drawing medium? Well, there's so many. Um, I always think of, uh, there's a quote from the movie Lawrence of Arabia, Arabia, where a reporter asks, what is it, Major Lawrence, that attracts you personally to the desert? And Lawrence answers, it's clean. And I always like that idea with metal point. There's something clean and um, precise and careful and elegant about it. Um, there's a, an instructor at the Pennsylvania Academy, Jill Rupinski, and she calls silver point the gourmet of line drawing. Mm. And I, I really like that quote. Um, thanks to Daryl Babatunde Smith for that quote. It really sums up so much about um, metal point, silver point drawing. I also like that it's a quiet meditative medium that you have to develop over time. It gradually emerges and it's akin to egg temper in that way. Yeah. So there's a patience, there's a focus, there's a quietness, there's a peacefulness about it. So I love that aspect of it. And finally, as you know, George, I love craft and science in art. And Metal Point gives so many opportunities for that because there's so many different supports and grounds. It's a Really an incredibly creative medium. So I love that part too. So what are the challenges you find in working in Silver Point? Well, I'd first like to address what I think is one of the, um, it's not a misconception. I think it's a little overplayed. And that's that, the, you know, a lot of people say the big challenge in Metal Point is that it can't be erased. And it's true that it's not as amenable to erasing as graphite or charcoal. But in fact, there, there's ways to get around that. I say that because I don't want beginners to feel discouraged by the requisite draftsmanship. Um, there's a wonderful drawing by Durr, the artist Durr, in the early 1500s of a, it's called Dog Resting. And they've looked at it under certain lights. Um, I don't know what the, you know, ex experiment they, is, they run on it where they can see the charcoal drawing that underlies the silver point dog. So Durr went in with an erasable medium charcoal roughed in the dog and then drew silver point on top of that. And there are little ways you can erase on certain grounds that are built up in multiple layers or you can sand. And so do you need good draftsmanship? Absolutely. But there, I don't want people to feel they have to have flawless, impeccable draftsmanship. There are ways to work around that. I think that the challenge of any medium, the most important thing is to love and be drawn to your medium. And then 
That kind of fascination and love pulls you through the inevitable challenges that any becoming good at any medium is going to pose for you. So you have to make sure it really suits your nature and suits your visual goals as a painter. And then I think it will pull you through the learning curve and the challenges. There is a certain amount of craft involved, mm -hmm. I think, in understanding the ground. And the more that you understand and can manage the ground, the more success you'll have in drawing and be able to achieve your goals. So you do have to apply a little bit of uh, you know, understanding the ground and coming up with the ground that best suits what you're trying to achieve. So right. those are some things to consider. And you've done quite a number of experiments with different types of yeah. grounds. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk us through uh, some of those things? Sure. Um, I like a lot of what a lot of silver point artists are challenged by is the limited value range. There's a peacefulness, there's a beauty to that limited value range. But on the other hand, something exciting in painting is a full range of values or, or in drawing too. So a lot of metal point artists try to figure out how do I extract more values from this medium where you're mostly in you know, the, the, the light to mid dark gray zone. So I've done a lot of playing around with adding things to grounds to increase the abrasion. Um, how many, you sent me many <laughs> different things to try. I dug up a bunch of my own, bone ash, silica, pumice, um, barite, all sorts of different uh, you know, white fillers and um, tried them out and a lot of different, adding them to a variety of binders. I've tried oil binder, egg tempera, egg as a binder, um, gouache, gum arabic, uh, casein, you name it. Um, and that's what I mean about the creativity of metal point. There's, if you can just raise the pigment load in a binder sufficiently to create a rough, irregular, toothy surface, and then if you make sure that that pigment load has a certain amount of hardness to it, so for example, titanium, pumice, silica, they're all in the six to seven on the Mohs hardness scale, whereas most metal nibs are about a two to a three, you're going to get abrasion. So um, playing with the different binders, playing with how much pigment I can add to the binder and still make it viable, a strong ground, and then adding the solids that will increase the hardness. So you not just get to, you don't have just tooth, but you have hardness. Tooth plus hardness is really the secret to a good metal point ground. <clears throat> Right, and and just for uh, our audience that do, don't know what Mohs hardness, it's it's a measurement of okay. mineral hardness, and it's a scale that goes from one to ten. One being, I, I believe, it was soapstone or some form talc of talc. Sometimes, and then, some then the hardest uh, is, of course, diamonds. Correct. And uh, so that's an important because, uh, in addition to the minerals having hardness, of course, the the metals have their own hardness, most of them Correct. being very soft. Right. Well, let me just say, George, speaking of the number 10 diamond, that um, you can buy diamond dust. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> I really, I am going to try this in the spring. I'm going to buy um, a small quantity of diamond dust and add it to a ground and just see what happens. Yeah. Well, that's that would be worthwhile experimenting. Sure. And I know um, you've done experiments with things like pumice, which is a silicate. Yeah. And... Yep. Um, and what is the uh, the other thing I know you've uh, you've discovered is how the ground affects the color of the metal or yeah. the the the, uh, mm -hmm. the deposit. Right, right. Yeah, it's remarkable, and um, I, I would hate to say I discovered it because I know some other plenty of other experienced silver point artists have experienced this too, noting that metals tarnish differently depending on the ground. And um, I have done a series of ground um, tarnishing experiments where I took, I think it was seven different metal nibs, and I applied them to, I believe, eight different grounds, including plaque paper, a black gesso, and then a bunch of other homemade and um, pre-prepared grounds for metal point. Uh, and then I exposed them to di different tarnishing elements, um, apple cider vinegar, very acidic, um, liver of sulfur, and then also garlic and onions. Um, and the reason I know that garlic and onions affect the drawing is my husband, he's retired now, but he was a vegetable farmer. 
And whenever he harvested the garlic or onions in the adjoining building, my uh, drawings would tarnish much more quickly. <laughs> so, I took the, yeah, it was, it was like, wow, this is really making That's a difference. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I, I took these various sample panels um, with these different nib marks and uh, grounds, and I exposed them to uh, these elements for anywhere from 24 to 36, then 72 hours. And it was just remarkable how differently all the nibs colored depending on the ground. You would think the copper would look the same. It'd only be changed by the tarnishing element, but no, it was also affected by the ground for sure. And then the really uh, illuminating thing was um, that after 72 hours, I would say maybe 40% of all marks completely disappeared. Hmm. Because what a lot of people, obviously one of the things that people love about metal point is that the drawing tarnishes. It, it takes on a life of its own once you're done with it. It's exposed to elements and it changes color and it, it mostly deepens in value. And so people love this magical, mysterious alchemy that takes place when they're done with the drawing. But it's important for artists to realize that tarnishing is a reaction to corrosive materials, you know, attacking the metal. And if you overdo it with tarnishing, you will degrade the metal deposits on the drawing to the point where they fall off and your drawing will disappear. Or as you and I have talked about um, zinc, if you expose it to a, a zinc metal point mark, if you expose it to certain tarnishing elements, can transition to white. And so you may not lose the particles, but they're no longer you know, visible on a white ground. So tarnishing is wonderful, but you do have to approach it with that understanding and a certain amount of caution. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a, care, that's a very important consideration. And mm -hmm. because I know a lot of uh, silver point artists are experimenting with tarnishing. Of course, the, the most common one is liver of sulfur, but yep. some of those results may be totally unexpected and usually pretty uneven. I think you found that also. Absolutely. Yeah, you can have a copper point. Copper will tarnish to different colors depending on what the element is in the atmosphere it can turn green or blue or a dirty brown. And um, you may have a part of the drawing that gets a spot of nice, rich green in the copper and then nowhere else. And there's something magical about the lack of control and the, <laughs> the drawing seems to have a mind of its own. But um, it can also be problematic at times, for sure. Right. Well, how do you mount or protect your, your silver point drawings once they're completed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a tricky question because metal point drawings are vulnerable. They, as we've talked about, they're vulnerable to tarnishing. They're also on this absorbent, irregular surface that can, you know, things can attach to it. They can get dirty and the dust embed in that irregular surface. So they really do need to be protected. And um, what I mostly do is I frame under museum glass but I don't really like artwork under glass. I like the immediacy, the physicality of a work of art. So I'm experimenting with varnishing metal point drawings. And as you and I have discussed in length, um, varnishing uh, mediums that have these very irregular, porous, open surfaces, these high pigment volume concentrate surfaces like a temper or metal point is complicated because the initial varnish layer pretty much becomes part of the work of art. It adheres in a way that it's not readily removable. So I understand it's complicated. Um, there are pros and cons to every option, but I'm basically trying to figure out how to varnish them akin to how I varnish my egg temper paintings, because I like that layer of protection that still allows the drawing to be so immediate and, and present and not behind glass. Mm -hmm. So, Ku, can you explain um, what you did with this uh, this one image uh, with the girl and has a cap? Uh, looks like a mm -hmm. yep. uh, really wonderful amount of texture going on in this particular drawing. Yeah. Well, what I did in that drawing, that was a lot of fun. I worked with the Rublev temper ground as my ground, a um, little few additives to it to further increase the abrasion. And then I tinted it with a variety of colors. Something that's sort of fun to do is to think about ground like paint. And you can essentially paint with ground if you tint it different colors. And so I developed somewhat 
variation of color to get the sky and, and a bit of the landscape. And then I started working up my metal point drawing, but I wasn't getting enough from it. I wasn't getting enough depth of value or variety or atmosphere. So what I did is I took the original blue tinted temper ground and I thinned it, thinned it, thinned it, and I applied what I call a scumble, a very thin transpa transparent layer of the white over the whole drawing. <laughs> I do this in my egg temper classes to my students all the time where I scumble over or they scumble over their images and there's a moment of what am I doing? I've worked so hard to build up this image and now I'm covering it. But if the layer's thin enough, like a veil or a mist, it injects a bit of atmosphere. Um, it unifies disparate marks. And in the case of metal point, it reinstates the ground. So once again, you're back to some of the original abrasion. So you can start building up your darks again. So I tried that and it worked well. So then I tried it again and I did it again and I probably developed that drawing, knocked it back with a scumble of ground, developed it back and forth eight or 10, I, I lost track of how many times I scumbled over that with ground. And the end result was it gave it more atmosphere than I can sometimes get from my other metal point drawings where it's just the metal mark, which I love, but I, I like all this variety too. So. That gives, I feel, that drawing um, a little more atmosphere because of all that layering of scumbles. Can you explain what you did with this image of the rabbit? Um, and, it, and it appears, uh, of course, it's on, on paper uh, with, a, uh, with a, a gold leaf background, apparently, of course, on, yep. on a wood panel. Yep, yep. So I did that drawing on, it's a handmade paper, a well-known company called Twin Rocker. It was a 320 pound gorgeous handmade deckled edge paper. And when I finished the drawing, I floated it on a panel that I gold leafed and it's raised about, a, I don't know, I think an eighth of an inch above the panel. There's a backing behind it. So it really looks like it floats above the gold. And the drawing itself was similar to the lily and landscape drawing in which I started by developing a ground of different colors that would begin to, um, you know, convey the sky versus uh, the landscape. Um, and built up layer after layer, did some scumbling, but what was a fun technique in that image was the brocade behind the rabbit. I rubbed some copper wool over the area where the brocade was to go. And then I placed down a commercial stencil. There's just fabulous stencils available now. And I took ground and I sponged on ground, you know, to create the stencil pattern. And then I again rubbed uh, copper wool over that stenciled on ground pattern. And then I, you know, did that over and over with a couple of different stencils just to get that richness of layering. So yet again, another fun tool, our stencils can be used to apply grounds and create different textures or patterns that you can then draw on top of with metal point. So... Lots of fun things that you can do. Yeah, a lot of very interesting, um, yeah. very interesting textures and patterns going on. It looks really nice. Yeah. yeah, layering. You know, egg temper prepares you for infinite layering. And the same can be applied to metal point. It's also lovely to do a quick sketch in metal point. I'm not saying it's required, but mm -hmm. for those of us who love to layer, metal point has that same potential and it can yield some really wonderful atmospheric rich results for sure. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. So um, was there anything else that we should um, mention? Yeah, I, I, I want to say one more thing to beginners because, um, you know, I teach a lot of workshops and what I run into often are people who are understandably very eager to get better and it's, you know, it takes time. And uh, so I really want to encourage people because Metal Point is a medium um, that takes time both to acquire knowledge of the craft and the skill, but also just for the image to emerge. And, you know, sometimes if people don't see results right away, they feel like they're doing something wrong mm -hmm. or it's, it's me or it's the medium. And it might not be either. These things just take time. And there's a wonderful Michelangelo quote, genius is eternal patience. So for beginners, what I always say is give yourself time to get good. Just, you know, get lost in the process and give yourself time. Right. And that's so yeah. true for so much, so many traditional mediums. Uh, yes, true for exactly. tempera. I know it's for fresco. Mm -hmm. Very true. And a lot of people work at it for hours and then go, well, nothing's happening. Yeah, but, exactly. But and you just be patient. 
be patient. Yeah, patience is, is a big part of that. Yeah, for sure. And that seems to be more and more difficult to do these days. And I think so. Even with artists. And in fact, it's a good antidote. Uh, you know, that's one of the reasons I value these mediums, because it is a good antidote to the rush and um, lack of patience we're all experiencing these days, is to get lost in these mediums and have faith and trust in the results if you hang in there. Right. Very good. Well, thank you, Koo, for taking the time to talk Welcome. to us and share some of your experiences with uh, with Silverpoint and your artwork uh, and the really incredible variety of things that can be done that you've shown us, not just, mm -hmm. you know, this uh, black and white drawing, but uh, even <laughs> incorporating with color. Yeah, well, my pleasure, as always. I'm so grateful to you and Tanya for your support of traditional mediums and traditional artists and for sharing this knowledge with others because I know there are so many artists who love these traditional ways of working. So it's a joy to share it with others. Thank you. Well, thank you. So for those of you who survived for whole hour, and so we have a um, gift for you. We have a uh, cool today online. And uh, while George will uh, figure out how to put two of us together. Oh, hi, cool. Hey. <laughs> hey. So Great to see you, everybody. To see you. So, yes. <laughs> so uh, yeah. looks like uh, based on uh, response, uh, we did very well today. So uh, everybody's so excited. Yeah. And so uh, thank you very much being uh, being friend with George for so many years. And I, I, uh, I can Absolutely. tell you that, uh, yes, uh, George, uh, George has four artists, uh, Leaving artist, he, uh, he excuse uh, me. I'm going to move. I think my yeah. Wi-Fi is is oh. a little weak. I'm going to reestablish this. Yes, Hi, everybody. Yes. I'm sorry, but I have to get closer to my okay. router, and then um, I'll get back where it's uh... good. We can see you. Oh, okay. Oh, she so, froze. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> she's coming. She's uh, she's in Mexico, and she's yes. broadcasting from right. there. So great. So we'll. I so hope we'll that, that reestablished it. Sorry. It's, Oh, Oops. we lost it's, her. Okay. So she can just dial back in. In the meanwhile, so like there I, was... Um, um, I, what the one uh, hmm. second I mentioned, so then uh, Ku is one of this uh, artist who uh, George absolutely adore and... Uh, he, Sorry. Right? Yeah. There she is. <laughs> so uh, for, for her absolute knowledge and, um, and how she approaches uh, every painting uh of your and so how much she learned every time and so in fact she was cool you went twice to our classes yes and uh yeah i took the painting best practices twice yeah. i want to take it again I'd, I'd take it about 10 more times if i could but <laughs> fantastic class and i love pushing george on the egg tempera end of it because i know it tends to you know, oil tends to predominate in the room. So somebody's got to speak up for egg tempera for sure. Yes. Uh, and uh, you are the one who pushes him for sure. So, mm -hmm. and he loves push, <laughs> he push <laughs> people. I like to get pushed around. Yes. yes. Push the, <laughs> push. Um, so uh, just uh, because uh, I saw a couple uh, questions about, so I just want to mention, uh, and uh, Ku, thank you very much for uh, mentioning this. I completely forgot. And of course, uh, our son will kill me if I will not uh, say that. So here's oh, uh, tempera mm -hmm. panels. And so yeah. it's very easy way to start uh, to draw because uh, we uh, it's an aluminum panel and this is uh this is with tem uh tempera ground already so it's very easy to uh, uh to start if you don't like the paper so uh then this is of course what we have already prepared for you or you can do like what kuda so uh she's using our uh, uh tempera ground and looks like she's editing uh something else there and so <laughs> Then let's go. Let's. Uh, we have a couple questions. I'm going to start with this question. Oops. Let me oh, see. Oh, we can like see that. Can't. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me, we can. I'm going to put that on a. Let me just put this on a white background for some reason. It, oh, hold we on. had uh, a, a lot of uh, questions for you, and uh... I actually saw that question oh. earlier. If right. you want me to jump in. Sure. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, it's by a, um, a really good Silverpoint artist, Lori. Hi, Lori. Um, 
does the patina occur over time? Um, is it faster with the liver of sulfur the same? Um, so liver of sulfur, you can buy it in a jar and you can put it, um, a craft supplier sell it and put it in a little open container and the fumes will expose the drawing and speed up the tarnishing. Um, is it as fast as when a drawing is just exposed to the elements? Well, it really varies what elements you're exposed to. Um, another, uh, Margaret Krug, um, she does silver point drawings in Italy near Sulphur Springs. Sure, that will be pretty fast tarnishing. Uh, if your husband has a garlic and onion business next door, that will speed up tarnishing. So it really depends um, if the liver of sulfur is going to be faster than your environment. It depends what your environment is. But as I said in the interview, um, don't try to speed it up too much because you just can pay a price for that because it will be the beginning of the degradation of the metal point marks. So, yeah, there you go. There's another question and a couple of, there's a couple of questions on varnishing metal point. Could you mm -hmm. uh, talk to us about that? Sure. I saw one earlier about um, what do I do, use to varnish? And, you know, George and I have had this conversation for a couple of decades now about how to varnish egg temper paintings. And it's been quite a learning process for me. Um, and what happens is egg tempera and metal points have this characteristic called high pigment volume concentrate. And what it means is there's a very high percentage of pigments relative to the binder in egg temper paint and in metal point within the ground. And it's that very high pigment load. It's so high, in fact, that the pigment particles protrude above the surface of the binder. And that's what creates that microscopically irregular rough surface in egg temper for the paint to latch onto and in metal point to abrade the metal nib and also for the metal deposits to latch onto. Um, and so to smooth the surface, the metal deposits won't adhere as well. Um, so when you're varnishing these surface, the problem that arises is the varnish also attaches very well to that high PVC irregular surface. And it's probably not something that's gonna come off a varnish on an egg temper painting, on a metal point drawing. So what you do is you first isolate the image and what you hope to achieve is a thin, non-yellowing, kind of inconsequential layer that more or less fills in the high PV PVC and separates the artwork from the varnish you apply on top of the isolating layer. It's a complicated subject. I've written extensively about it. George talks about it. So that's enough of an introduction. Um, but what do I use for an isolating layer? Um, you know, I use shellac and the conservators don't like that I do that. I could go into the pros and cons. Uh, there's a lot of synthetic materials you can use. I'm, I'm playing with B72, George. Um, Natural Pigment supplies a, a version of B72 in solution already. What's that, what's that one called? The, um, Is your... that polymeric? Yeah, the polymeric uh, yeah. Uh, it's... Uh, varnish. Yeah, it's the Conservar yeah. polymeric varnish. That's yeah. the, that's the so, uh, Paraloid B72. Correct. So you can isolate with those and then you put the varnish on top. Um, I, you know, I, I see in the comments section that I do use shellac, but I just want to clarify that conservators find that problematic. And if you want to, you know, understand why you can read my book or write me about it. I don't want to take up too much time with that. Um, so I haven't done a lot of varnishing of metal points. I'm playing with that idea. And does it affect the shine? Yeah, it changes the shine for sure. And you lose that part of it. And the one thing I've learned after all this time is every material, every working method gives something and takes something. And um, it's important to protect a metal point drawing and glazing under, you know, using a frame and glass is problematic and varnishing has some problems too. You definitely give something up. For me, it was surprised to see zinc uh, on your uh, chart. Yeah, it was not. I, I actually, first, I didn't even understand when I saw that first. And I thought, like, okay, she mentioned zinc, but she didn't put anything. Mm -hmm. And then... no, I did. It got eaten away. Let me also, I also noticed in the comment section um, something about wax. And yes, um, you can wax a drawing, but I don't think, I think you could run into a lot of problems if you wax it without isolating it first, because the, you know, wax, the fact that it's a paste, you've got to rub it on. I think you could 
degrade or lift or smear, so to speak, metal point um, particles, deposits. So I would isolate, and then I have done that, isolated with shellac or B72, and then um, put a wax medium varnish on top. And it's a lovely finish. It's a gorgeous finish, for sure. So that works too. Thank you. I'm going to add this one comment from another comment from Lori about uh, making darker marks. Mm hmm. Well, boy, how long do we have? <laughs> uh, it's OK. OK, Let's so um, the key to dark marks is there's several things. And of course, everyone knows about as I my little toothiness that I've talked about in the high PVC ground that creates abrasion and think of it as microscopic sandpaper. You need that to abrade the metal nib to rub off little particles, deposits of metal that create a line. But the other part of that is hardness. It's not just because imagine if you had this toothy surface, but it was made of, you know, cotton <laughs> or, you know, or talc. If it was soft, that metal nib would just wear it right down. So in addition to the tooth, you need that tooth to be harder than the metal nib. And um, George mentioned the Mohs, M-O-H-S, hardness scale, named after the man who figured it out. And most, uh, it's a scale of one to 10, and most metal nibs are, you know, lead is a one, tin is a one, pewter and bismuth are twos, silvers and golds are threes, something like that. You get a, nothing higher than about a 3.5 for most metal points. So, and then most fillers that we would use in a ground are higher than that. Zinc is, I think, a four and titanium, I think, a six. But what if you start doing things like pumice, which is a, um, a six and a half, I think, or silica, seven. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the more a tooth you have and the harder that tooth, the more it will abrade the nib. Um, so what do I add, Lori? I, I, you know, my two favorite go to are pigment, uh, Pigment add additives are silica and pumice. And I like them in part because in my testing, which is admittedly all limited, I'm just one artist trying to mostly paint and draw, but um, they also brought out extra color in the nib. Um, as um, another artist was saying that it's strange how you can have a gold point that looks like beautiful shiny gold, but when you draw with it, it's just a dull gray. And why that is, is because a solid piece of metal is very continuous and reflects light very continuously. But when you break it into a gazillion tiny particles of metal, you're not reflecting the light the same way. The more you build up the metal particles, the more you'll get the shine and the original color of the metal. Um, but certainly, at first, I don't know why this is, but for some reason, the pumice and the silica, maybe it's how it abrades the metal nib. But for some reason, it brings out more of the individual color of the different nibs. So um, that will help to increase your darks to some degree. Uh, another little trick is um, you can rub carbon black onto a surface. Uh, this is bringing you into a different medium, of course. If you don't have a binder with it, it's not like you're painting with it. but. Um, there's a well-known artist out there who I believe this is one of the ways that deep darks are achieved, where if you take carbon black pigment, it's a very small particle size. It's about 0.5 microns, whereas most pigments we work with are 1 to 5 or even 10 microns. So carbon black is about the smallest particle size pigment you can work with. And it will rub into that high PV surface, high PVC surface of metal point, and then you can draw on top of that carbon black. And that too would expand your value range, admittedly, by introducing another medium. And then the final thing, of course, is adding white heightening to a drawing. If, if you work on a toned or tinted ground and develop your metal marks, then at the end, you can start to bring out the highlights using pretty much any white medium. It could be chalk or colored pencil or egg tempera or gouache or you know whatever you want to start to bring out the white highlights. So those are a few ideas. There's this uh, question about what is the best surface <laughs> for a metal point? 
hundred thousand dollar question. Yes, it I, is. I, I thought we explained and uh, every artist is so different. So yeah. then, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a great question because, and it's one of the joys, but initially one of the confounding things about Metal Point is because of the variety. And um, as I said in my interview, you can take almost any binder. I think the one exception, and George, you can jump in here if it's wrong. I think wax uh, would not make a good binder for a metal point ground because the wax never fully hardens and it can't have the high pigment load necessary. Yeah, it's too soft. But, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. too soft. But almost any other binder, you could oil, egg yolk, um, gum arabic, uh, casein, um, you know, a, a polymer, a, a vinyl or acrylic polymer, any of those you are able with certain amount of care, you, you know, raise the pigment load sufficiently. It's either an inherently a high PVC paint like casein or egg temper, or you raise the pigment load safely, um, not to so much that the ground becomes fragile, but there's tests for that. But anyhow, so that you get that effect. Um, and it, it can be an egg, it can be a metal point ground. I, I found an oil ground with a high PVC worked fabulous for metal point. It took a long time for the oil to cure, so it's not a ground for the impatient, but so any ground, and then the ground gives you your support. Um, you know, paper boards, paper boards, um, wood-based panels, all those work if the ground is compatible with that support. So for example, if you're working with a traditional metal point ground um, made with rabbit skin glue and a very, or an animal glue and a very high PVC, that's a fragile ground. You can't put too many of those on paper because it could crack, then you're back to a rigid support. But if you're doing a single wash of a zinc um, gouache, which works fantastic as a metal point ground, put it on any paper you want, uh, you know, heavyweight, um, you know, less le lesser weight papers. Um, generally, most metal point artists want a hot press paper because they want the smoothness so the nib doesn't skip or jump. But you can do it on a, a rough cold press paper too if you like the skippy, jumpy nib mark. Um, so it depends on your goals and um, your visual goals and your nature. I, I like the artist saying that he likes paper. I like rigid supports. Everybody's different. And that's one of the fantastic things about metal point. It's a little confounding at first because you have to kind of know what you're shooting for, but it can suit almost any nature um, and any visual goal. I was thinking about like <clears throat> when we talk about uh, all kind of oil colors or watercolors, the range of the colors and you think, yeah. Like, <clears throat> when we talk about, you know, with, uh, with artists and you kind of understand what one likes one thing, another one. Here's metal point, and I thought gray is gray, and <laughs> no, whoosh. So yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Never mind working on black grounds, and you know, no, it's it. The variety is overwhelming. It's it's very exciting. In a full interview, please uh, check uh, Ku's uh, uh, Ku's images there. So uh, George and uh, Ku uh, talking about this incredible image on on black. Uh, uh, surface, so that would be mm -hmm. great. So I'm so <clears throat> sorry we cut that out. No, oh, um, you guys did a great job. No worries. <laughs> so here's a question. Of course, just talking mm -hmm. about grounds and a black ground, mm -hmm. um, and I know I know Ku, you've done this. Uh, maybe you can answer that question about gold point on black grounds. Sure. Um, it's very hard to make a black ground yourself because the fillers that most people use to make a gesso are white. <laughs> So um, you have to get special fillers that are transparent. Um, and so, but there's plenty of great black grounds on the market. Or um, you could use a black paint that has a high PVC. So Golden's Gesso, um, they make a black ground that works well. Um, there's black casein paint, black oil paint. Uh, so I hope that distinction is clear. Paint is primarily pigments, so just have all black pigments and just raise the pigment load and that gives you your black ground. Or if you're going to work with an actual ground like a gesso, you probably have to buy it commercially prepared because most artists don't have the fillers to make a truly black ground. You'd get a gray ground. Um, so, but working on a black ground is exciting. It's challenging because the tonal range is even more limited. But the benefit of that <clears throat> is that 
as I said, the, the pumice and the silica seem to bring out more color in the marks. And before I forget, let me say, always wear a mask with these additives, these fillers you put in, particularly things like sil silica, which are clearly not good to breathe in. But um, yeah, so just as those uh, additives can bring out the color of a mark, black gesso, black grounds really bring out the coloration in metal point nibs. And in the thing that Tanya was just talking about, that's in the full length interview, a drawing I did on black gesso, the entire bird, it's an Oriole and the orange and yellow <clears throat> and rust in his breast is entirely made with gold and um, brass and copper points. And that becomes more apparent, as I say, on a black ground. And Susan Schwab, she's a very well-known um, metal point artist. She and Tom Azulo wrote a fantastic book on metal point. And Susan specializes in abstract images um, on black grounds where the coloration of the nib shows through. So that's C-H-W-A-L-B. I hope that got that right, Susan. Um, and if you look up her images, you'll see the possibility for bringing out enormous coloration on a black ground. One uh, time, quite uh, some time ago, we went to opening uh, of Susan. Um, yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, we are Gorgeous. talking about, uh, um, you know, like reproduction. And when we went uh, live, mm -hmm. uh, it just blew my mind. It's just completely totally changed my idea about silver points. And so oh, that's great. Uh, you guys need to check that, uh, that um, mm -hmm. artist too. Just to continue the discussion about grounds, uh, I know you mentioned about zinc, and the, Lori has a question about zinc, and of course, mm -hmm. oil grounds. Uh, and does this extend to water-based medium? So the cracking in oil, uh, in, in right. zinc oil, oil paintings. Well, George, you're probably better able to answer that. <laughs> I, I just want to say that it's important, for, Lori's an experienced artist, silver point artist, a metal point artist, for people to distinguish, it can get confusing because you can work with a zinc nib, which is a metal wire, or you can add the pigment zinc to your ground. And those are two distinct things. Um, so just first make that distinction when we're talking about a zinc point in the image Tanya showed where the zinc had, fa had faded, that was a zinc metal nib drawn across a ground, not zinc pigment added to a ground, but you can add zinc pigment to a ground. Um, so, uh, George, go ahead and take that away about how that affects, um, you so, know more about that. Too. Right. So the, the issue is with zinc white in oil paint and oil only. grounds only. It does not extend to any water-based medium. So that's that we just want to make that very clear. And so adding zinc into a glue ground into a gouache ground or any one of these types of water-based grounds, no problem. And in fact, as, as you mentioned, Ku, and I know some other artists uh, have found that zinc does a, uh, also has a, does a wonderful job in abrading the tips. Yeah. So let's go on to another question. Um, let me see here. The, um, Oh, yes, uh, I'll add this one from uh, Michele. Have you experimented adding color on top of the ground, not within the ground, and how would that work with Silver Point? This is a great question um, because it, it can be very helpful for a beginner. Working on a tinted ground, as I said, is kind of magical because you have this fairly limited value range and your drawing can be lovely and elegant and exquisite, Boy, when you add those highlights with whitening, it suddenly gets very exciting. So tinted grounds are fantastic. Couple of tips. Don't make the tint too dark because most metal point, if you have a value scale of zero to 10, let's say, with zero being black and 10 being white, there's always exceptions, but most metal point marks hang out in the, you know, seven to three range or something like that, or, or two range, or probably not that dark, but anyhow. So if you tint your dark, your ground too dark, you're not gonna see your marks at all. So first keep the tint very light, generally speaking, with some exceptions. Um, the other thing is it generally is better depending on how many ground layers you develop to tint the ground itself and not apply it on top. And the reason is, there's a couple of reasons. 
One is as you draw, work away on the drawing with your nib and you just scratch, 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 <laughs> just line after line after line. If you start to disrupt the surface at any point, you can scratch through that color and suddenly you're competing with the white ground underneath and that can be a problem to have to deal with that. The other thing is uh, what I was talking about in my interview with erasing, um, one of the benefits, uh, you can have a metal point ground that's a single layer or two layers of a zinc wash. It doesn't have to be a highly developed ground. My preference is for grounds that you can build up in multiple layers. And if you haven't tinted the ground throughout and you just apply the tint on top and you go to sand the ground to get it smooth, or you go to sand part of the drawing to slightly erase, you're gonna see a different color underneath. So having a really consistently tinted ground, if you're gonna build it in multiple layers is important to do. Having said that, I often do mixed media in my metal points. And the one that um, Tanya spoke about earlier, the Oriole, that started as a black gesso. And the blacks in the Oriole are from the gesso. But at the end, I did sponge on a layer of color behind the Oreo with egg tempera paint, um, Prussian blue to kind of enhance the, the cool of the Prussian, enhance the warmth of the bird's breast. So I did paint on top. But in terms of first preparing a ground, tinting it, and then drawing on top, I would always choose to tint the entire ground. Great. And the tinting ground, we can mm -hmm. do with... Woohoo! Dispersions! dispersions, dispersions. Yes. <laughs> if you don't really? like pigments, really? although um, you you still use most the pigments, not uh, uh, dispersions are not working for you very well. Yes, is that? Well, in a tempera, I make my own pigments, pigment paste. I always work in paste form. I'm a bit advocate for being careful with the dust, so I always work with pigment paste and I make my own mm -hmm. for the most part, except for very small particle size, hard to disperse colors like quinacridone or Prussian. But to tint a drawing, I really recommend um, if you're going to work with any small particle size or modern colors to tint, work with a commercial dispersion. It's just too hard to fully di disperse anything that's less than about a micron size. And you'll get streaks, particularly if you develop a multiple layer ground and you go to sand the ground and you run into a little clump of Prussian blue, you're going to get a streak of Prussian. So, yeah. but if you work with earth pigments to tint and earth pigments tint beautifully, they're nicely controlled and they increase abrasion for the most part because they're rough, irregular morphologies, shapes. They're fairly large particle size and um, they're fairly hard. So tinting with earth pigments work, works beautifully and because of their larger particle size, they disperse fairly readily. So. I don't think you need to do an earth dispersion per se to tint a ground. I think you would want to first get the powdered pigment with a palette knife, disperse it by hand on a palette, and then add it into your ground mm -hmm. to get the dispersion. But I think you could do um, that by hand. And I, this has made me think of one more thing, <laughs> as is my way, um, talking about the importance of tooth and that bit of the ground. Uh, understand that there's a point at which too much tooth isn't useful. And George and I have talked about this. Um, when you have too toothy of a ground, in fact, uh, the metal nib abrades too large particles and inconsistently, and the metal doesn't attach as well. So there is, while a metal point ground absolutely needs this microscopic irregular tooth, don't go to the point of thinking, oh, great, the larger the tooth, the darker the mark or something. No, the, at some point, if it, the ground is too rough, like visibly rough sandpaper, it doesn't hold or make uh, as dark or consistent or durable of a mark. Do you burnish afterwards or not? Or it's No, no. I, I don't. And everybody's different, but um, some people talk about burnishing the metal point ground, and this is the trade-off, is that the, the smoother the surface that you're drawing on, the more perfectly fine the line is mm -hmm. and consistent. Mm -hmm. But if you burnish too much, you can start to knock back the tooth, and then uh -huh. you won't get as much abrasion. Mm -hmm. So um, I like a perfectly smooth in terms of no visible striations in the gesso, but I don't, I like it microscopically rough. So I don't go more than I'd say like a 280 grit sandpaper. I'm not looking for an ivory piano key because at that point, you know, your marks don't abrade and don't attach as well. 
And I think that can be some of the problem with some of these perfectly smooth mineral and um, uh, sulfite papers is they're so smooth and they um, make a gorgeous line, but I've heard stories of quite a few of drawings disappearing. And I think it's because they are lacking enough microscopic tooth to hold on to the metal deposits as well. That's my guess. But. What about like burnishing the drawing, like like in gilding when we are burnishing the, you know, like specific lines yeah. and so is, is there mm -hmm. practice of that? I'm going to try it, Tanya. I don't know. <laughs> You've given me another distraction in the studio. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> my, my, guess, my guess is that you could end up abrading um, or lifting. You know, the problem with metal point doing these tests is that there's so many grounds. There's yes. so many supports yes. that it's hard to do one test and say this is definitive. So mm -hmm. in some circumstances that might work and in some they then it might not. And if anybody out there has any experience with this, I'm sure um, all three of us would be really interested in hearing. Yeah, that. because see like what uh, when in gilding what we are doing. So when we uh, mm -hmm. make a shell, uh, shell gold, you, so we are taking this burnisher and so the specific lines and so then where it's burnish, where it's not burnish. And I thought like maybe you have. Yeah. Tried OK, so we're, we're going to try it. OK, but OK, okay <laughs> Tanya, here, now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Some, so to some degree, you end up burnishing the surface by the action of drawing, and um, mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah, and that is actually the problem. At some point, um, everybody out there who's a metal point artist knows that as you start to reach for mm -hmm. that darker mark, you mm -hmm. the temptation to press harder is irresistible. But all you're doing at that point is you're not abrading more off the nib; you're just starting to work down your high PVC toothy surface until the point where it's not abrasive anymore. And so if you burnish your ground too much during the drawing process by the mere act of drawing, you will stop abrading your nib. Um, so uh, whether you could do that at the end or whether you don't need to because your drawing has kind of done it for you. Um, if that happens, if there's metal point artists out there who struggle with that, who find they have the, the habit of abrading their surface to the point where they can't dislodge any more metal, then that idea that um, both Aaron and I talked about scumbling on top where you reinstate the ground very, 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 very thinly. So you don't bury your drawing. You can, that's one way to start to reinstate abrasion. Got it. Thank you. We sure. have uh, maybe just, uh, this is an interesting question from Eileen okay. mm -hmm. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. um, and she talks about her process of building darks. And she also mentions that, uh, that initially the, the ground is resistant to uh, further, uh, further uh, marks, mm -hmm. but after a while, it. Um, she asked the question: Is that it? It will take it after mm -hmm. if she waits a little bit of time. Is this because that area has begun to oxidize, in essence, creating its own tooth? And I think there's a little bit of confusion in that terminology, but maybe mm -hmm. you can answer or speak yeah. to that a little bit. Well, um, hi, Eileen. Eileen's a fantastic um, metal point artist. She just posted a gorgeous um, image on her Instagram page of a beautiful silver point drawing where she's getting very wonderful deep darks. Um, and Eileen, I don't know. It's an interesting thing. I have that both with vague tempera and with metal point that the surface seems to get tired mm -hmm. of being worked, tired of us <laughs> at the end of the day. And you let it sit and you come back and the next day it seems more welcoming. And I don't, I don't know, George, what do you think? I, it doesn't quite make sense to me that oxidation would increase the tooth in the ground. I'd have to think about it, Eileen. Do you have any thoughts, George? I don't think it would necessarily increase the tooth, um, but certainly the oxidation is a change. Uh, it would actually change the mm -hmm. particles to some degree and maybe uh, mm -hmm. just like when you see rust, of course, this oxidation is yeah. not the same thing as rust, yeah. but uh, but just as you see rust starts to, f you can take a shiny piece of metal, starts to rust, and you see the surface becomes very matte. And uh, But mm -hmm. this is a slightly different process. So, um, you know, we, 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 we recently this. purchased yeah. a, a high-powered microscope in our lab, and so this is something that we can start taking a look at. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I mean, I could imagine... It's fascinating what's happening is that, you know, metals corrode through air, through moisture, through sulfides, through a million different chemicals compel metals to corrode. And so the patina is a reaction, the metal's trying to protect itself. 
yeah, by true. forming this layer. And so maybe the particles are forming and they have a different particle size, morphology. I don't know. So it's get that possible. microscope yeah. and let us know. And uh, let me see. I th uh, here's an interesting question because I, I, I'm sure people will ask about it. And that is, is there a transparent silver point ground recipe? Yeah. <laughs> this is great. So um, <laughs> when I was doing this thing where I was scumbling over my drawings to reinstate abrasion, I like that I was using, you know, I, I used the temper ground quite a bit um, to do this. Um, and I didn't mind that it also put a little bit of white because those scumbles over images, they unify um, brush, you know, drawing marks, they create more unity and atmosphere. They impart all sorts of things, a layer of white. But I did reach a point where I was like, well, I want more abrasion, but I don't want to keep covering my drawing. And so I experimented with some matte medium um, and adding abrasive particles to that. And I actually did some experimenting with the Goldens team. Um, you know that team, the uh, Golden Artist Colors has a fantastic team of techs. And I asked them about, could I do this with a matte medium? And they did, an, uh, I'll send you an image of this, George, a demo panel where they tried different of their transparent matte mediums combined with abrasive elements like silica and you know chalk and things to use for me as a scumbling agent over images. But I think you probably could use that as a transparent ground. Does that make sense to you, George? It does. Um, it, it's because of the, the fillers, it's not gonna be mm -hmm. as you know, water clear or water you know, white transparent. Um, mm -hmm. and it's going to be translucent at best. It will depend on the actual fillers yeah. used and the refractive index Very good point. between yeah. the medium and, of course, the fillers. And uh, it, We could probably get close, but it'll probably have to get with something like ground glass, and I'm not sure how that would uh, work, uh, if right. that would work very well at all. But I have tried powdered glass as an additive for abrasion, but as you know perfectly well, George, that um, even powdered glass cannot be perfectly translucent depending right. on the grind. And uh, this is important for people to understand that um, this is the classic example that chalk added to oil paint is transparent because it's fully surrounded by paint. But once chalk is in the medium, so to speak, of air, it's opaque white. And the very fact that all metal point grounds are high PVC with these pit pigment particles that protrude above the surface of the binder means that you'd have to start with a 100% transparent filler, not one that just happens to be transparent when surrounded by binder, mm -hmm. because in a high PVC surface, the particles aren't fully surrounded by binder. So that would be the trick to get a truly transparent particle. Right. Yeah. yeah. So one uh, more, okay. I guess, uh, mm -hmm. And maybe we'll have to stop here. Yes. Lori, Lori adds uh, she used. Well, we're just uh, getting going. We can do all day. <laughs> yeah. yes. I know that. <laughs> uh, Lori adds that uh, she tried Williamsburg pastel ground, which is a matte medium, and it worked great. Um, so that uh, that might be a little suggestion there, um, yeah. as someone working on that. And I think, uh, oh, let's. I think we'll conclude this. And very importantly, we had a question, does Ku teach any classes? Of That's course what does. I was saying then. I <laughs> so wanted maybe to finish Ku, you with could do that. A so, little, yes. little plug. And <laughs> we'll actually put a link to uh, your website uh, below the YouTube video. But um, uh, maybe you could okay. talk just about what your classes are. Yeah, I do teach um, workshops. I teach four or five workshops a year, uh, mostly at Tempra. Uh, but I do have a metal point class that I teach every year. I'm teaching it at my studio in September. Um, it's very comprehensive. The first day we make three different, uh, four different grounds on four different supports. I go over additives. You have a choice to include um, additives in the ground to increase abrasion. I bring about 30 different metal nibs. Yes, I have that many nib metal nibs. It comes with a complete metal point kit that you get to take home, including three different nibs and a bunch of papers and grounds that you've made in class. Um, and uh, so I teach that and I, and I teach a traditional painting design or traditional old master imagery design course. Um, so all that's on my website. And um, clearly, I love to share these mediums and everybody's welcome to come. And of course, you have tempera, uh, tempera classes too, yes? Yeah, I have um, 
three temper classes this year and uh yeah and um all levels are welcome and um we go into depth it's a lot of fun so and it's life i mean fun. it's in person in person in person yeah i <laughs> and i do have one online course that i um taught and will be available on an ongoing basis in february uh, produced by acorn arts you can find that on my website but mostly i love to teach in person the classes are fairly small they're very one-on-one -on -one. um yeah so you know it's one of my great pleasures as a painter is to teach great thank you cool thank you very much and you're so welcome <laughs> thank you so, so I actually think uh, all our artists, mm -hmm. and so um, I, again, I apologize to cutting uh, all your interviews, but uh, it will be available right after when we finish this, uh, this session, and you can uh, watch full links. And so thank you guys for being with us. And uh, so now we know it's, uh, it's success, and so then we probably will bring more artists, and uh, cool, you will be first on our tempera session. <laughs> Well, we'll have to make it six hours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. Have a great day Thanks and uh, see you next um, uh, month. I don't even know what the, the date will be. We will announce again. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you very much. See you next time. Bye now. Bye.